Okay, so as usual for my review sessions, this will be <coughs> no new material, all uh, stuff which we've covered already. And I guess everyone feels ridiculously well prepared for the exam, which is why they're not here. Um, or they are not prepared at all, and so they've got a lot more work to do, as the case may be, between now and then. Um, I will have my regular office hours today. I will also, if people need to ask any more questions, please email me, email me excuse me, or try and find me tomorrow. Um, we can probably set up some extra office hours, at least in the morning. Afternoon will be challenging, unless at least I know a couple of you are in my um, lab, and so you can come grab me in the lab as well. Okay, so we started out way back when talking about lambda. Just briefly about lambda, the big picture with lambda, of course, is that we have these two different ways of growing. You've got lytic replication and you've got lysogenic replication. And it's really all about transcriptional regulation, which determines whether it is going to replicate lytically or lysogenically. <clears throat> Main thing really is these two promoters, PL and PR. So if you will get transcription from PL and PR, eventually this will end up leading to lysis. And the main way that these guys are controlled is this anti-termination with the N protein. It stops termination at each of these terminators, the little t left and right. This is, again, what happens when you have lysis. If you have lysogeny, this is blocking the activity of those PL and PR promoters. What does the blocking is the lambda repressor, quote unquote repressor. See, now the pointer is deciding not to work for me. Uh, this lambda repressor, again, is blocking PR um, and also at the same time blocking PL. And this is why it's a quote unquote repressor, is because it's activating transcription in its own promoter. So positive feedback loop in terms of making sure that you have lots and lots of repressors. So a repressor blocks down PL and PR. That gives you lysogenic replication. If you have PL and PR, you're going to have lytic replication. And of course, that brings us to how do you get this choice between lytic replication and lysogenic replication. And it has to do with the relative concentrations of CRO, which is the control of repressor and other proteins. Again, wonderfully creative naming here. Or lambda C1, um, the clear mutant, if you get rid of it, meaning that you lytic all the time. And the difference here is just how well these two proteins bind to these DNA binding sites around both the <coughs> PR promoter and the PL promoter. If you have lots of crow around, it will bind and not block PR and PL. If you have lots of C1 around, it will bind to PR and block PR and PL. So it really depends, again, relative amounts of C1 versus crow. How do you get that? That has to do with C2. So, and again, C2. C1, C3, mutations in these proteins, it leads to clear plaques or lytic growth. So C2, C2 positively regulates C1. And if you have <clears throat> enough C2 around, you're going to end up with C1. You'll block everything. But that only happens if the cell is unhappy. The way that the cell knows that it's unhappy is going to be the presence of C3. So this is the ridiculously straightforward mechanism of regulation. So um, if we're thinking about <clears throat> lysogenic growth, it's all about C1. C1 makes more of itself, blocks the N protein, which is that critical thing leading to your lytic growth, and also blocks CRO, which is, again, not going to lead to lytic growth. On the other hand, if you have CRO, that blocks C1 and leads to your lytic production um, of everything else. This is mostly about the regulation of, <coughs> excuse me, this is going to be mostly lysogeny again through C1, but CRO. And this is a balance of C1 
versus Crow. Questions on Lambda? Felt like forever ago that we talked about Lambda. Yeah? Uh, what's the shell with that and the release of the Ah, what is it that cleaves C1? Okay, so that's the, <laughs> the opposite sort of thing. And I'll just start answering your question, and correct me if I'm not going the right direction here. But basically, you're lysogenic, and at some point you need to go lytic. So you need to get rid of C1. Um, how is C1 gotten rid of? It's actually a cellular protease which will break down C1. And that cellular protease then leads to that process. And the cellular protease is activated when there's DNA damage. The other lambda questions. OK, switch gears completely and talk a little bit about plant viruses. Again, this is a whole course. Go to Corvallis and take a whole course on plant viruses. Um, fascinating, wonderful, and interesting. We're just you know, barely skimming the surface as far as is concerned. A couple of really critical things about these <clears throat> viruses. We talked mostly about cucumber mosaic virus, but uh, many of these viruses replicate in multiple virions. So somebody called me out last time about not talking about viruses with multiple genomes before, multiple genome segments. These are multiple genome segments that are packaged in multiple different virions. Again, unlike flu, which we talked about last time. So here, multiple genome segments, multiple capsids, and this probably only works because you have some massive damage that happens to the plant. Or maybe things are getting from cell to cell. That was the, the latest, greatest news as far as these plant viruses are concerned. But at least as far as we're concerned, it's the fact that you have an aphid, you have some kind of damage that happens to the cell very high multiplicities of infection. And that way you get multiple capsids with multiple genomes. And you do need these multiple genomes in order to be able to replicate. So briefly, we have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is what you have to have for all of these RNA viruses. These are positive strand, so you just have to have that coding sequence for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You also have a capsid protein. And at least in theory, those are the only things you need. You need an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and a capsid protein. Now, these are plants. And so in plants, you also need to get around from cell to cell. That's this movement protein, which is here. Um, actually, on a same RNA with the capsid protein, you also have a capsid protein with a shorter one. And then you have this cap sequence. And this is where I messed up when I did the lecture the first time. This cap, the 5 prime methyl cap, is absolutely required for, well, actually not absolutely required, because we'll talk about the irises a little later on, but required for regular cellular translational initiation. So you have to have the translation initiation proteins bind to this, and then you get translation. Um, this cap is formed by virus proteins, and it's formed by virus proteins in the cytoplasm. And so this is the <clears throat> methyl transferase, and probably this RNA helicase has something to do with that as well. Methyl transferase is important for making the cap structure. And so that's how these RNAs get recognized as messenger RNAs and then get made. The three prime end here is very different in cucumber mosaic virus and actually a lot of other plant viruses. Here it's shown as a clover leaf in a little bit more detail. Um, this is that two dimensional structure right here. Um, I don't think that, at least in looking at this structure, that it looks like a tRNA, but the cell thinks that it does. Um, amino acyl tRNA synthetases will recognize this structure and, in many cases, actually add a amino acid to the 3' end. And this helps protect the 3' end and may, and this is a lot of hand waving here, be involved in helping to get the translational machinery to these RNAs, which are not your standard messenger RNAs. Standard messenger RNA would have the poly A tail. Uh, but you've got that tRNA. It looks like it maybe it could be part of a ribosome. It'll help bring the ribosome to these particular RNAs and allow them to be translated. This is just a reminder, again, that this one, that methyl transferase domain, which is important for making five prime caps. Um, movement proteins, and you know, these are the ones which are going to be a little bit more specific for those plant viruses, although there are a number of other 
<coughs> excuse me, viral proteins that are involved in making caps that I didn't talk about before, but do bear um, a little bit more repeating. So this is actually not a plant virus, but one of my favorite viruses, or I should say virus ecology. <coughs> Any, anybody taking microbial ecology, by the way? Okay, so you'll hear some of this a little later on when I give my guest lecture, so you can you know, tune out for a second here. But <clears throat> there are these really um, amazing plants, and we see these um, when we go out in the hot spring environments and are collecting, um, growing right next to hot springs up to about 50, 55 degrees Celsius. Um, these particular grasses can only grow at those high temperatures if they have an endophytic, so inside, growing inside the plant fungus, and only if this fungus is infected with one of these thermal tolerance viruses. And so plants are not happy if they're lacking either the fungus or the virus. Um, and so these are the good viruses, um, at least an example of a good virus, at least as far as the plant is concerned. Um, what it does to the fungus is actually an interesting question and no one really completely understands. It's very hard to grow in the absence of the plant. So very different story there. Uh, mentioned the multipartite genome, the sort of extreme example, or some of the extreme examples of these uh, were just talked about <clears throat> this last year, where you had eight different genome segments in eight different capsids, which could function all together, even at a relatively low MOI, and the question was, do all of these genome segments actually have to get into one cell in order to be able to have a productive virus replication? And in this paper, they showed that that's not completely true. You can actually have genes from one of these segments in one cell and genes from another segment in a different cell and then have the proteins go from one cell to the next. So at least in theory, you can have infections in multiple different cells in the plant, but then they could come together in order to make a productive virus infection. Um, they didn't actually show that in this paper, which is one of the things the guys on TWIV were um, very upset about, but um, still um, really fascinating. So this whole idea, which I sort of present, again, it's a textbook idea, the way that you can have these multiple capsids be functional in terms of a virus infection works only if you have these really high MOIs. Well, Maybe it works if you also have movement proteins and ways of getting different genomes from different parts of the, your organism. So um, fascinating question there. More questions on plant viruses before we move on and talk about the, the animal viruses. Okay, so the <clears throat> first one of these RNA viruses that we talked about, well, I should say family, I should say. These are the picoRNA viruses, also known as picornaviruses which have a small capsid, also a positive strand genome. These capsids are pseudo T equals three, and the only pseudo business about them is it's multiple different proteins, in this case, three proteins on the exterior shell, but still arranged in a quasi-equivalent pattern, and these structures are extremely similar to each other. One of the things that I think I didn't mention terribly well um, the first time around is if you look at these five-fold axes of symmetry, right next to them is this kind of depression, and this is what's called the canyon, and that's where the receptor binds. So it's not actually this projection here at the five-fold axis. It's right next to the five-fold axis of symmetry where your receptor binds. And that's shown here where we have receptor binding right next to the VP1, which is present at this five-fold axis. Once you have this receptor binding, then you have a conformational change of an internal protein, which basically makes a hole in the membrane of the host, again, the cytoplasmic membrane of the host. This should seem really familiar because that's what almost all of the, okay, almost all of the, it's not an alarm that I know of. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> The hole through the membrane is a lot like most of the bacteriophage. So that's the way that the genome is getting in. This genome, unlike all the genomes we've talked about really so far, has a protein which is covalently bound to the 5' end of the genome. Um, this is our 
VPG protein, and it's potentially also bringing this protein into the cell as much as it is bringing the RNA inside the cell, which is how we're getting the input of the genome. So people argue whether it's this protein transport or whether it's the nucleic acid transport. We just happen to get this inside the cell. What does this genome look like? It's one RNA. It's made up of multiple different subunits, you could say, um, of one big polyprotein. So there is one start codon and one stop codon in all of the picoRNA virus genome. Um, and that's one of the things that makes them specific. So here, once translation starts, you make one massive protein. And that one massive protein, of course, gets chopped up into smaller pieces by the viral proteases. And those viral proteases are functional in the polyprotein. And so what that means is actually between a bunch of these, and particularly this 3C protease, that there have got to be flexible linkers, flexible polypeptide chains, which then allow this protein to have activity on all of these other proteins, or I should say one big protein, and chopping it into smaller pieces. We already talked about the VPG present here at the 5' prime end of the genome, and these have poly A tails at the 3' prime end of the genome, but these poly A tails are all encoded in the viral sequence. So not like stuttering, all that stuff that we talked about, crazy polymerases doing weird things um, when you come with stretches of use. This is coded in the genome. So at least for the polioviruses and the enteroviruses. Turns out that the rhinoviruses, most of those that are, are causing the, the cold, actually I may have one today, a little sniffly if it's not the allergies, uh, those actually have different structures, which are more like some of the plant virus structures, strangely enough, at their <clears throat> three prime ends of the genomes. But for the enteroviruses and polio in particular, um, this three prime end is, is coded um, for in the genome. How are these genomes replicated? Again, we're coded at the end of the genome with this poly A tail. What that means is, is that the antigenome sequence and the five prime end of the genome are U's because that's going to be the complement of the tail. So just the fact that these are coding poly A tails in their genome, and they're a positive strand RNA virus, means that you know the sequence at the five prime end of the genome. It's going to be U's because it has to be because that's what's going to have to pair over here at the other end. So you got a stretch of U's and um, stretch of A's to give you that part of the genome. So these, <clears throat> these U residues, again, can pair at this end. They're bound to a tyrosine on VPG, and this is what's called protein-primed replication. And we'll talk about more protein-primed replication after the midterm. But this is the first example of a protein providing the OH that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can extend from. Another thing to mention here, I mentioned that we have the iris, so internal ribosome entry site at the 5' prime end of the genome, because this isn't a cap. And so you don't have cellular translation happening here. You have to have some other way of starting translation. And that some other way is a secondary structure which forms in the RNA that allows the ribosome to bind and enter there. There are other secondary structures here which are important also for replication, and there are cellular proteins that associate with these as well. It's these cellular proteins that are recognized in the structure together with the viral polymerase. This actually will make two U's starting off of this central sequence right in the middle of your genome, and then transfer to the end where you have vesicles, and these membrane vesicles are concentrating the virus proteins. They're also concentrating the virus genomes. Um, and it seems that vesicles, <clears throat> particularly for these RNA viruses, are very important for getting your replication of the genomes. Part of that is probably, and we'll see this for the flaviviruses in just a second, is protecting double-stranded RNA from being detected by the rest of the cell. Because double-stranded RNA is sort of this you know, alarm 
feature that happens inside the cell is that, hey, you're infected by an RNA virus, it's replicating itself, and it means there's something we need to try and take care of. And so that's the idea of these <coughs> um, probably vesicles. Um, concentration and then sequestration of the double-stranded RNA from the rest of the cell. Why do we talk about polio? Because polio was a really nasty disease, still is, fortunately, in very few parts of the world. Um, there were over 30,000 cases a year in the U.S. before we had vaccines. Um, the first vaccine was developed in the mid-1950s, and then the early 1960s, the second vaccine. The first of these vaccines is the inactivated polio vaccine, so you make regular polio in cell culture, and it was the development of cell culture that really allowed this to take place, and part of it was also the use of Henrietta Lacks cells that we don't need to get any more detail about here. Uh, but that availability of cell culture, being able to make massive quantities of virus, allowed the formation of these vaccines. Um, inactivated polio virus needs to be injected, so it's a lot harder to actually administer, but it <clears throat> is something that doesn't have the problem that the oral polio vaccine has. Um, oral polio vaccine is an attenuated vaccine, and so the whole idea of attenuation, <clears throat> which I'll talk about again when we talk about rabies, is you infect an organism, in this case, remember originally I think it was mice in the case of attenuated polio vaccine, and then isolate that virus, put it back into that same host, do this many, many times, and eventually you end up with a virus which doesn't cause disease but can still replicate, which is really nice, particularly in developing countries, because you can immunize one person and that person can actually spread this vaccine to other people. Unfortunately, you can also have reversion. So the whole process of making it less pathogenic um, can be reversed, and you end up with more pathogenic viruses um, later on. But because of the success of these two vaccines, we are almost rid of polio, um, except for places where it's rather politically unstable, um, right here or in 2018, particularly this part of Syria, but still um, very low numbers. And this is you know, was worldwide as of last year, and this big issue right here, vaccine-derived polio. So these are those cases where the oral polio vaccine has reverted. Um, one thing that is happening now, and in fact I didn't have a chance to upgrade my lectures about this, actually may have been after my polio virus lecture, uh, that all of the countries now, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria, are all now actually getting much more of the inactivated polio vaccine. So they've made a whole bunch of batches of inactivated polio vaccine have been delivering those that part of the world um, because that cannot revert. Um, and that's the, the process right here that hopefully will allow um, complete eradication of polio. Um, and I, this is, I think, one of the very few cases I've seen with the smiling baby while it's getting a shot, and there should be more of these. Actually, my kids were reasonably happy when they got their shots too. Then we had guest lecture, um, Alec Hirsch from OHSU talked about flaviviruses. Flaviviruses are basically those picoRNA viruses that have envelopes around the outside um, and cause more frequent disease definitely than polio. And one of the big problems is we don't have very good vaccines, particularly for dengue, which is one of the most, actually one of the most common vaccine, oh, sorry, vaccine treatable diseases, but um, also mosquito transmitted diseases. But there are lots of different flaviviruses. Um, it's not just um, yellow fever and dengue. Um, hepatitis C, it turns out, is also one of these kinds of viruses, West Nile virus, um, et cetera, et cetera. M almost all of these, again, with the exception of the hepatitis Z viruses, are transmitted via mosquitoes. Um, and particularly important and understood for yellow fever, but also for dengue, turns out that they have to replicate in mosquitoes. Um, unless you have a very large dose, um, you only have transmission if you have a mosquito which feeds on someone or some animal which has circulating flaviovirus disease, and then there's 
a week, or in some cases almost as much as two weeks, that you have growth in the mosquito. And so these are really interesting viruses in that they can replicate both in mosquito cells and in human cells. Um, and this is here really a pretty big difference as compared to most of the viruses that we've talked about so far. And any of us who know more about biology than me, which is probably most of you, um, know that insects and uh, mammals are really very, very different in terms of how they replicate and their cells are very different as well. So it's pretty amazing that these viruses end up being able to replicate in actually both of these, both of these kinds of places. Dengue um, is the big problem. Um, yellow fever is still a bit of an issue, but there's much less of it in the world. Dengue is extremely widespread. You know, up to 40% of the world's population is in areas where dengue fever can and in fact is very widespread. Um, and you know, up to half a million have very severe disease. Um, still relatively small numbers are lethal, but by the time you multiply that by the entire world, there's still many, many cases of, of people who are dying from, from dengue fever. How does dengue replicate? Actually, the replication process is not at all dissimilar from what happens in the picoRNA viruses. You have replication of a polyprotein, um, gets inside the cell. Of course, this is different because these are enveloped viruses rather than naked viruses. But once you have membrane fusion, your genome is released. That's a positive strand RNA. That positive strand RNA gets translated. Um, many of the proteins that are involved in making these virions, again, it's an enveloped virus, so a lot of these are membrane proteins. It's actually translated at the endoplasmic reticulum, which is just where you would have all of these being made. Then you also have your genome replication that's happening at these membrane vesicles and eventually being produced. The last, so the very last step or penultimate step of formation of these viruses is a proteolysis step from the membrane protein, which goes from a pre-membrane protein to the membrane protein. This proteolysis is happening just as the virions are being released. And it's a cellular protease which is involved in this process. Um, didn't mention this for the picoRNA viruses, but there's also a proteolysis that takes place in the capsid proteins. Um, and all of these seem to be that very last step in virion production. It's an irreversible step or basically irreversible. Once you've cleaved a peptide bond, it's highly unlikely to reform and gives you that metastability um, of the virion. Same thing is true here. Same thing is true of a lot of the fusion proteins that we've seen in terms of flu and some of the other ones as well. So this proteolysis effect. Um, dengue is a great target for vaccines. There is, however, a big problem with making vaccines and also for dengue virus disease. This is this antibody-mediated enhancement. And so what happens is if you are infected with one of the four different dengue serotypes and then get infected by a second one, which is not one of that first serotype, then you can have much worse disease. And what that means is apparently, and I think as far as I understood from Dr. Hirsch, the jury is still a little bit out on this, um, is that actual antibodies binding to your virus can lead to it being taken up into cells otherwise where it wouldn't be or it wouldn't be taken up as quickly. Um, and so that's where the, the big problems are with antibody mediated enhancement. And what that means is if you have a vaccine and you're trying to use it to protect against all four serotypes of dengue, you've got to protect against all, feros, all four serotypes, excuse me, at the same level at the same time. And that doesn't seem to be happening with the current dengue virus vaccine, the Dengvaxia, which was you know, just approved in the US for people who have already had one strain of dengue. Um, so, um, but the, the problem was if this was the first kind of dengue um, exposure that you had, that then an actual infection of dengue after vaccination would be worse than uh, getting the, the vaccine in the first place. So we really don't want to have that happen. It's a cartoon which I like from 
Dr. Hirsch's lecture, which shows that we have lots of secondary structures. Um, these guys actually have caps. Um, I'm pretty sure that those caps are made by the viral proteins. I'm not absolutely certain on that one. And then um, the three prime end has lots of secondary structure. It does not have a poly A tail. And then here, I think what's quite nicely shown are these <clears throat> different proteins that are being made, um, again, one of them in the membrane because this is an enveloped virus. And a number of these are also the viral proteases, which are chopping out the other proteins that are eventually going to be making up you know, first the non-structural proteins, and particularly the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And look, there's that methyltransferase. So that's what's doing the capping structure. Um, and <clears throat> then the structural proteins, um, capsid and the envelope proteins here, these are all present at the five prime end of your genome um, and are then proteolytically cleaved to eventually give you your final structure. Where is this taking place? Again, it's in these membrane vesicles, and he showed these really nice images of, from transmission electron micrographs of where you have these vesicles that have formed um, probably to protect the double-stranded RNA intermediates from any kind of cellular proteins going eek. You know, look, there's double-stranded RNA. I need to turn on my interferon response and, and react appropriately to what's going on there. Um, I mentioned vaccines a little bit before. This is the Dengvaxia, I believe. Let's see, which one? Um, here we are, Dengvaxia down here at the bottom. Uh, no, which one? No, Sanofi Pasteur, sorry, this one up here. Um, this is all, this is the one which is currently being used, again, it's currently approved in the US, um, has the pre-membrane um, pre and envelope protein from the four different dengue serotypes otherwise in the yellow fever vaccine backbone. Um, the big problem with this seems that you know, some of these work better than others in terms of getting an immune response. There are other dengue vaccines that are moving along here, which are different kinds of mixtures of different forms of dengue. None of them are on this um, yellow fever backbone. Um, so hopefully these vaccines will end up working much better for naive, i.e. kids who haven't had dengue before, and it's not going to cause that antibody mediated enhancement. Um, part of the problem is that people only really noticed that when there were literally you know, hundreds of thousands of people who were getting these vaccines. And this tells you, I think, when you're discussing with your pro-disease colleagues, friends, family, uh, that people care a lot about the safety of these vaccines, and there's huge amounts of testing that goes into them. Um, and the fact that this uh, particular vaccine is not great um, was only found out after testing of probably almost millions of people, and there were two or three cases where it was actually negative. So, um, but again, hopefully these guys are going to be better, but it's a really, um, excuse me, high bar to get across to actually get these vaccines out. And, and people really do care a lot about safety. It's one of the number one concerns about this. So any questions on these flavies, flaviviruses at this point? Okay. Bigger, single-stranded, positive-strand RNA viruses. These are the coronaviruses. Why do we mostly care about coronaviruses? Because there was this outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was thought to have come from civet cats, but uh, now is pretty clear, circulates normally in bats. Um, and there's you know, many, 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 many different coronaviruses, not just in this case, which was a Philippine study, but also in the US, you know, many coronaviruses around, also have MERS coronavirus, also probably originally in bats, but is transferred through some other animal and eventually has gotten us into humans. What do these coronaviruses look like? They've got these crowns around the outside, that's what that spike protein is, um, membrane proteins, and then helical nucleocapsids on the inside. And so we've seen now with 
quite a few more of the now negative strand RNA viruses. Many of these enveloped viruses are packaging their genomes as helical forms inside an envelope. And these uh, viruses then bind to surface receptors, have membrane um, fusion that takes place, and this genome is released. These genomes are big. Uh, the largest ones so far have been found, actually so far just bioinformatically, up to 41,000 bases in length, which is far longer than anybody thought an RNA virus could be. Um, the reason for that is that RNA-dependent RNA polymerases do not proofread. And so, just mathematically speaking, every time you replicate, if you're making tens, if not hundreds of errors, it's really hard to imagine that you would have a complete functional genome if you have something which is that large. Um, there are two ways that these viruses seem to get around that. One is there actually is a little bit of error correction that takes place. And the second one that I forgot to mention, which is partly why I put this into my review session as well, is the recombination which is happening when you're getting all the subgenomic RNAs, we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, that recombination probably also allows you to deal with otherwise deleterious mutations. And so, um, as hopefully either I talked about in molecular biology, you've talked about in genetics or some of your other courses, one of the really good reasons to have a diploid genome and sex is you can have recombination, which can get rid of deleterious mutations. And so, recombination here, probably between coronavirus genomes, also allows you to get rid of deleterious mutations. Um, these guys also have caps. Um, they have poly A tails as well. The poly A tails are coded for in the genome, so a lot like the picoRNA viruses. And the cap is made by viral proteins. And so the viral proteins are making these cap structures. Um, when they're translated, these are mostly translated as a polyprotein. But the polyprotein is actually in two different reading frames. There's a frame shift that happens in some translation, not all translation. So it means you end up with more of the proteins over here, less of the proteins over here. But these are all our non-structural proteins. Structural proteins you need a lot more of, although, curiously enough, the flaviviruses and the picoRNA viruses seem to get away with having as much of their non-structural as their structural proteins. Here you have the subgenomic RNAs. So subgenomic RNAs, lots of RNAs for your structural proteins, fewer for your non-structural proteins. How does that happen? Well, all of these RNAs have caps on them. Again, this is not terribly surprising because it's some of the non-structural proteins which can make these cap structures. But they also have this sequence at the end, which is only present at the five prime end of the genome. And it's not present here in front of all of these subgenomic RNAs. And so this was sort of the discovery which led to the idea of the nested subgenomic RNAs. So it was not so much the cap, but it was this sequence here on all of these RNAs that look like the five prime end of the genome. So how is this working? We've now discovered that you have the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will bind to the three prime end of the genome and start to make a negative strand. It will get to one of these intergenic sequences, also known as the TRS sequence, and some frequency of the time will recombine and go over here to the beginning of your genome and copy this leader sequence. And so that's how the leader sequence ends up at the end of all of these subgenomic RNAs. Uh, that leader sequence, of course, these are the orange is your negative strand, so this is actually not be able to be translated. The black ones are all your positive strands. These are the ones which are actually going to end up being <coughs> excuse me, translated. Um, then lots of subgenomic, subgenomic negative strand RNAs that then get 
um, copied into this positive strand subgenomic RNAs. And part of the way that this was this mechanism was discovered was actually discovering a lot of these negative strand subgenomic RNAs, um, and that they all had the, the appropriate sequences here um, which copied them. So the last thing I mentioned as far as these coronaviruses is not SARS but MERS. Um, MERS has probably killed three to four times as many people as SARS ever did. Um, but nobody talks about it because it doesn't seem to be circulating here as much. Um, and oops, so <clears throat> almost all cases of MERS have emerged from Saudi Arabia, from camels being transmitted to humans, and then those humans transmitting to humans as well. Um, still circulating, still trying to figure out um, how we can address this. The main process that people are trying to use right now is a camel vaccine, and so try and prevent the spread of the coronavirus disease in camels, and if one could do that, then one would stop the transmission to humans. Um, even though the circulating form, the reservoir part, is almost definitely in bats. Um, but if we could prevent any kind of symptomatic disease, and really just the amount of virus being produced in the camels, then you could prevent it being um, transmitted to humans. And, MERS, actually very similar to SARS, only can be transmitted, and actually for that matter Ebola as well, um, really pretty close contact. And so the, um, if you can stop that kind of progression in close contact, one of the things about close contact means you actually have to have really quite a lot of virus being transferred. That's why you need such close contact, unlike things like measles and some of the other um, diseases where you don't have very many virions that are acquired. MERS, SARS, Ebola, you need large quantities of virions to be transferred to actually come down with disease. So preventing it or even just lowering the amounts in the camels would make a big difference. Um, and part of the problem is that um, with humans it really doesn't make much sense because there's only you know, a few cases that are happening um, here in Saudi Arabia. Oh, sorry, more questions on coronaviruses before we move over to the other side and talk about those negative strand viruses. <clears throat> so negative strand viruses, paramyxo and rhabdoviruses, measles, rabies, and then yeah, the phyloviruses being extremely similar to them, at least at a molecular level. These are enveloped viruses with negative strand RNA genomes, the mononegavirales, so single negative strand. Because they're negative strand viruses, these RNAs cannot be translated even when they get inside the cell. So virions have to bring with them these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. You have to have a protein that comes in with your genome. Um, not true for any of those positive strand viruses, but the negative strand ones you have to have this protein coming in because that's what's going to be making the positive strand, which can eventually be translated. Um, these are all also helical, or helically packed, I should say, um, RNAs inside an in envelope on the outside. Um, most of the studies that have been done on rhabdoviruses are in this vesicular stomatitis virus, because it's got an extremely broad host range, and that extremely broad host range is because of this glycoprotein, which is present on the, the envelope, the glycoprotein, which is both the receptor binding protein and the fusion protein, um, just one. And as my little diagram down at the bottom, this is supposed to be what Louis Pasteur did in terms of attenuation. So plug the bunnies with nasty rabies virus, get that virus out, put a few more bunnies in, they don't get quite as sick, so on and so forth repeat this many, many, many times, and then eventually end up with a virus which does not cause disease. Um, and um, one of the great things about the rabies vaccine is it can actually be used after exposure. Um, and so you can um, recover from that. <clears throat> These helically packaged nucleocapsids are, I think, really fascinating, and it's true for paramyxos, for rhabdos, for phyloviruses as well, and to some extent also for the flu viruses. Um, 
they're packaged so that the RNA is sticking out. Um, and sticking out in such a way that you can have the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will sit down at this end, and actually when this genome gets inside the cell, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is already sitting here at the three prime end of the genome. And it can make RNA from this genomic copy even as it's bound to the nucleocapsid protein. And these nucleocapsid proteins bind to six and exactly six nucleotides, such that you have no nucleotides hanging out for all of those hungry exonucleases to go after once you have the infection that takes place. So this is what these structures look like. Again, paramexo, rhabdo, all the same. And they have these binding sites at this end for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. What also seems to happen, and this is what I <clears throat> neglected to mention in my lecture, there are also some nucleotides that are present in the rest of the helical structure that also seem to be important for the binding of that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it's not just at the immediate three prime end of the genome, but there are these other sequences here as well that you have binding to. And so the protein is sitting down on this helical structure. And so it means that that helical structure really is the template, and it's got to be helical such that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can bind to and start to make the messenger RNAs and eventually the genome that it needs. So what does that genome look like? Again, it's a negative strand, has a leader sequence, which is what the polymerase is binding to, and then the structural proteins followed by the non-structural proteins, yeah. structural proteins at the three prime end, non-structural proteins at the five prime end. It's like many of these viruses, you need more of the structural proteins than you do of the non-structural proteins. How do you get more of those structural proteins? It's just because you start right here and you make a messenger RNA that corresponds to the nucleocapsid protein. At the end of that, each of these gray sequences is the same. You end up with a stretch of U's, and the polymerase will say, oh, U's, okay, I'll sit here and make a couple of A's, and then I'll make some more A's, and then make some more A's, and then sometimes I'll fall off, sometimes I will stay on and start making a messenger RNA here and continue. One question that I asked myself when I was going through here, well, these are all being made in the cytoplasm. What's going on at the three prime end of all of these messenger RNAs? Turns out that all these three prime ends have caps. All those cap structures come because it's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, pardon me, um, which also has methylase activity. So this L protein also has methylase activity. So poly-A tails due to stuttering and caps due to activity of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. These <clears throat> proteins then are made, and you'll end up with more of the end because occasionally the polymerase will fall off. The polymerase stays on here. The polymerase doesn't come in each time and restart here. So the polymerase actually stays associated with the DNA, or sorry, RNA, excuse me, um, and it, because it only is going to associate with the three prime end. And those sequences that I just showed you, only when these are, are particularly helical, that you'll end up making all of these different pieces. Um, so you end up with caps, again, from the L protein, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Once you end up with enough of this N protein, it will associate with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and then say, hey, stop doing this funny stuttering business. Um, it's time to replicate the whole genome. Uh, first make an antigenome, because that will now you be your positive strand for the whole genome. That then is a template for the negative strand of the genome negative strand of the genome, you make more and more of, gets packaged with your matrix protein, your fusion protein, your hemagglutinin, and your aminidase, and you have more virions that can go out. Uh, most important, at least as far as disease is concerned for us of these paramyxone rhabdoviruses, is measles. Topical, of course, because we are, I think all the, the outbreak is done in Clark County. I'm, I haven't seen any more um, reports on this. 
And unfortunately, it was below about 1,000 people, which means that people didn't end up getting really nasty diseases. Unfortunately, we are really pushing the 1,000 cases in the US right now, and it's about a, a one in 1,000 cases that have really nasty disease, um, encephalitis, um, potentially death as well. So I think we're, we're pushing, I think the last, I think measles-related death was in 2015, I remember correctly, in the US, but it would not surprise me if 2019 um, we get the next one. Um, so vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Uh, this is what happened for measles when the vaccine was introduced. Um, massive drop in terms of the number of cases. Um, and this was right about when I got my first vaccine. Tells you a little bit about how old I am. Um, and then there was still a few cases, and that's because the first dose was not sufficient. A second dose was recommended. And actually, I went back and checked. My second dose was right about here, um, right when I was applying for citizenship. So they said I need to get a second dose. I actually don't need to get a third dose, apparently. Um, but <clears throat> we've through these vaccines, we've been able to get these to an incredibly low level. Unfortunately, there are still groups of people who've decided that vaccines are not such a good idea, and um, we're still having these, these outbreaks, which my personal opinion is just completely crazy, but that's my personal opinion. Uh, questions on paramyxorabdos? Any of these? Okay, the really big rhabdoviruses that everybody seems to want to get a vaccine for as opposed to the ones which actually will, you know, probably end up killing some of us. Um, the phyloviruses, basically um, almost identical to the rhabdoviruses. Um, also negative strand, single genome, has a polymerase bound to the three prime end, also helical structure. Um, has this extra protein, um, VP30, which seems to be involved in regulation of getting appropriate messenger RNA. Um, glycoproteins on the outside, also very much like the rhabdo pro rhabdovirus proteins, are the receptor binding protein and the fusion protein. These genomes are extremely similar. Down here we've got the paramyxovirus genome. Up here we have one of these phylovirus genomes, with the exception that some of these have overlapping starts and stops for their messenger RNA. So this is also, I think, if anything, even better <clears throat> evidence than, you know, look like you could have the polymerase fall off and then come back on. Um, here, clearly, the polymerase is just doing its thing. It's making a poly A tail and then can start to make a new protein um, a little bit further on after that. One thing I did want to mention here is the big difference between the paramexos, rhabdos, and phyloviruses, um, and actually I should say for the Ebola virus, strangely enough, the Marburg virus doesn't seem to do this, um, there's a secreted glycoprotein and a glycoprotein which are encoded in the same gene, and they're only made as different proteins because there's stuttering that happens in the coding sequence. And that stuttering in the coding sequence is required to get your normal glycoprotein, the one that's sticking in the envelope of the virion, whereas this secreted glycoprotein seems to be fooling the immune system into thinking that it's taking care of the virus when it really isn't. Um, but again, this is where we have to have the editing inside a gene in order to be able to have a functional, functional virion. And that's basically what we have here. Um, your non-secreted version has a fusion peptide, um, gets chopped by a cellular protease, and then this guy will bind to the receptor, and fusion will happen. You get inside the cell. I mentioned the transcriptional regulation by VP30. Um, and again, it should be quote transcriptional regulation. It's just the formation of the messenger RNAs. Formation of messenger RNAs happens here. If you have a strong secondary structure, you're not going to make those messenger RNAs. If you don't have the strong secondary structures, you make those messenger RNAs. And that mostly seems to be through the presence of this VP30 protein. And one of the things I, again, forgot to emphasize, the VP30 protein is in the virion. So when the genome comes in together with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, 
it also has this protein which says, hey, you know, make the messenger RNAs um, which are present in this genome. Most people know about the <clears throat> West African Ebola outbreak, which was um, the largest outbreak by far. Um, at this point, about an order of magnitude larger than the second largest outbreak um, happened, started out here between Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, partly because of porous borders, partly because the medical systems here <clears throat> were really kind of decimated because this part of the world had had multiple civil wars and the fact that nobody expected Ebola to be there because it was mostly in Central Africa before. And then finally, probably and most importantly, is that the virus made its way to some of the urban centers, which fortunately, some wood to knock on, has not happened in the vast majority of Ebola virus outbreaks. And so these major population centers where we ended up having thousands of cases of disease. Mostly because of this, though, and because of the West Africa outbreak, people kind of went back into their freezers and dug out some of the vaccine candidates that they'd been working on. And one of those, um, which is working extremely well, is now taking vesicular stomatitis virus and putting the glycoprotein from Zaire Ebola virus on it. This works particularly well because, of course, Vesicular stomatitis virus is a very closely related virus to the filoviruses. This is a rhabdovirus. And so, you know, as I keep saying, you know, filoviruses are these big rhabdoviruses. Well, now it's the rhabdovirus that doesn't cause disease with the glycoprotein for cellular Ebola virus. Um, gives really nice protection. And at least in the original studies in West Africa, it was working very well. And even now in the current outbreak, it's working extremely well. Um, the major problem with the current outbreak is that this region of Central Africa and pushing its way into East Africa is incredibly politically unstable. Um, people get shot um, on a very regular basis, even some of the people who are trying to um, spread the word and spread the vaccine here. So. It's not so much the science, which is an issue here. It's much more um, a political, geopolitical issue um, as far as <clears throat> that's concerned. Where's Ebola come from? Um, again, it's probably circulating just like the coronaviruses in the bats. <clears throat> Occasionally, you have some <clears throat> crossover from the bats to non-human primates, um, potentially also some other species. And that then gets transferred occasionally to people. And then there can be circulation um, within people as well. Um, usually relatively self-limiting, unless there are lots and lots of people in close contact with each other or are refusing to get the vaccine for whatever kind of reason. So the last set of viruses that we talked about, and this is actually the really scary versions. These are the ones that kill literally tens of thousands of people in the US every year. How many died of Ebola in the US? Ever? One, yes. So um, be much more concerned about flu. Um, <clears throat> there are, in flu, again, this is a negative strand RNA virus, only we've got multiple segments, um, eight different segments that always are getting packaged. Um, and, but they're packaged in one virion, unlike those plant viruses where they're getting packaged in separate virions. These are all now getting packaged in single virions, and almost every protein that's coded for in the genome is packaged in virions, even this non-structural um, protein, too. Um, we've got a hemagglutinin protein. This is what binds the receptor, also serves as the fusion protein. Neuraminidase, which chops off that receptor, allows the virions to be released. They can go off and find another cell. This is the target of the only real antivirals that work at all well against flu. There's also a membrane channel, which used to be a pretty good drug target, except that all of the circulating influenza now is, in fact, resistant to the drugs that are used for this. This allowed acidification of the internal part of the virion, which allowed these nucleocapsids to be released. Um, matrix protein, which I'm 
talked about too much, but the matrix protein is the bridge between all these envelope proteins and nucleocapsid proteins. And then the NS protein here is involved in taking care of host defenses, so it makes sense that it be present in the virion as well. As soon as it gets inside the cell, then it starts to shut down some of the, the host defense mechanisms. How do we get release of the genome? Again, I mentioned this M2 protein. First thing that happens is you have receptor binding, get into the endosome, the pH goes down, you have a big conformational change, uh, the hemagglutinin protein that allows the fusion peptides to bind to cellular membranes. You get membrane fusion, and then that M2 protein allows acidification of the inside of the virion, releasing each of these eight genome segments. These eight genome segments then get transferred, should they transport it inside the nucleus. Um, still it amazes me that you get a particle this size that can you know, come inside the nucleus. Um, I would say this is probably even bigger than ribosomes. So the other thing, sort of the really huge thing that ends up going in and out of the nucleus. So each of these genome segments comes inside the nucleus, associated with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases sitting at the three prime end of the genome. Again, very similar to paramyxos, rhabdos, and filoviruses. These guys can start to make messenger RNA, but the big difference here with the messenger RNA production in flu viruses is they don't have a capping enzyme, they just steal caps from cellular messenger RNAs. And that cap stealing is why they seem to be in the nucleus. So all these other guys that are replicating out here in the cytoplasm, these guys get into the nucleus because they're stealing caps from cellular messenger RNAs. Those then get translated, re-imported back into the nucleus. We make antigenome and genome particles. These then get transported outside of the cell. I mentioned this <clears throat> cap stealing process already, where we have cellular messenger RNAs, caps get stolen, they get used to make the viral messenger RNAs. These have polyuse in them. These polyuse, just like we saw for paramyxos, rhabdos, phylos, um, are stuttered. So you add an end here. As soon as you start to get enough of the nucleocapsid protein, stuttering stops, and you start to make genomes. These genomes get packaged together, excuse me, um, into virions, eight genome segments, probably with a particular packaging signal at this end. Um, those end up in each of your individual virions. Flu, tens of thousands of people die every year of the flu in the US, so get your vaccines. Um, the other thing that these flu viruses can do, because they've got these different genome segments, they can mix and match them. And so that mixing and matching of genome segments, this is why we have pandemics and real emergence of diseases which otherwise <clears throat> we can't deal with. And so that process of, it's called reassortment, um, and you can think of this as sort of, you know, recombining of different genomes with each other. <clears throat> That's what leads to uh, major pandemics. So this is just that we see, you know, happens mostly in winter. And these are where all of those pandemics come from. More questions, send me some emails, come to my office hours today. Um, we can set up some more office hours tomorrow if people need them, at least in the morning or in the afternoon, if you're taking my lab class. Good luck.